but this video will be about the Riemann mapping theorem. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, state the theorem and then sketch the proof of it. So first of all, state what it is. I suppose you take any complicated open subset D of the complex plane. The Riemann mapping theorem says that this is isomorphic to the open unit disk. So this is just the complex number Z with Z um, having absolute value less than 1. Um, the only conditions are that D should be simply connected um, and open, as I said. And the next condition is that D should not be the whole of the complex plane. It, it fails for, for this one case. So Riemann sort of gave an argument for it in his thesis in about 1851. However, his argument was notoriously incomplete. It used something Riemann called the Dirichlet principle, and it wasn't really clear under what circumstances this was true, and it took about 50 years to, to sort out what was actually going on. So the first complete proofs of it were given about 50 or 60 years later by Osgood and Carathéodori and Coebi, so the theorem really ought to be named after them as well. Um, notice, by the way, that this open subset D can be pretty wild. So, for example, if I take an open square, then I can remove bits of it looking like this. So I can just remove lines. And um, you, you find that for the boundary of this square, there's actually no arc connecting a point on this boundary to a point in here because it would have to oscillate up and down um, um, an infinite distance um, and moreover we can make it even weirder so so I can I can remove some sort of weird fractal like object so I can take some sort of infinitely branching fractal in some very complicated way so this open set can really be extremely hairy and it's sort of amazing that you can always make it isomorphic to that 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 means you should have a holomorphic function from um, f from d to the unit disk, whose inverse is also holomorphic. Um, then we have this funny exception that d can't be the whole of c. Um, um, this follows because of Liouville's theorem, which says that there is no, that any bounded map on the complex numbers must be constant. So if you've got a map from the whole complex numbers to the unit disk, it must just be constant, so it can't be an isomorphism. Um, so um, now I'm going to uh, sketch the main idea of the proof. So the proof comes in uh, four steps. So um, the idea is we're going to look at maps from D to the um, um, open unit disk. Let's call this U. So here's going to be the map F, and here we've got some funny set D. And I'm going to choose a point in D, so I'm going to choose a special point Z0, and I'm going to choose the point naught in the unit disk, and, and I want the map to have the property that F of Z0 is 0, so it's going to take that point to that point. And we're going to choose um, F so that it's holomorphic and injective, and we want to maximize the derivative of f at, at z0. And what we want to show is that, 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 that there is, um, we need to show that there's a unique such function and it satisfies um, the, the, the conditions of, of Riemann's mapping theorem. So, um, so I suppose. Um, Let's call the space of all such maps F. So we need to show four things. First of all, we need to show that F is non-empty. Um, rather obviously, if there aren't any maps, of the, if there aren't any injective maps at all, we certainly can't find an isomorphism. Um, secondly, we need to show that F prime of Z naught is bounded above. And if it's bounded above, then it's and and um, that there is at least one such f. Then 
these two th maps together say that the um, values of f, the derivative of f at z naught, have a supremum. Um, thirdly, we want to show there exists. Sorry, there exists f um, with f prime of z naught maximal. Um, this is a rather subtle point. I mean, we can find functions with f prime z naught arbitrarily close to the maximum, but it's not clear that we can really take a limit of them. And this is actually um, something like this was the problem with Riemann's original proof. He kind of assumed you could you could take a limit of functions, and this is a rather subtle problem. Sometimes you can, and sometimes you can't. And finally, we've got to um, um, show that f is injective and surjective, where where um, this f is is the thing with with the derivative as large as possible. Um, so I'll go through these four steps. Um, um, first of all, um, um, we want to find, we need to find one f um, mapping d to the unit ball. And we notice this actually fails for uh, d, the complex numbers, as I mentioned before by Liouville's theorem. Here, here I want f to be injective and holomorphic. Um, and this is obvious if the domain D is bounded, because we can just translate it and multiply it by a constant, and that will put it inside the unit ball. And so what we want to do is to reduce the case when D is bounded. And, um, and because D is not equal to C, so D omits some point. And we may as well assume that this point is the origin because we can just translate it. And D is simply connected. And it emits zero. And what this means is um, we can define um, the square root function on D. And so, you know, normally there's a bit of a problem defining the square root function because it has a branch point at the origin and so on. But if we've got a simply connected region not containing zero, then we, we, we can actually define the square root function. And then we can check the image of D under the square root is not dense in the complex numbers. Um, Notice that D might have been dense, for instance, it might be the complex numbers minus the um, m minus the positive real axis or something like that. But by, by doing the square root trick, we can make sure it's not dense. So we can assume, again, if it's not dense, we can translate and assume it omits um, um, a small disk with center zero and then if we if if we map um d if we map it by taking z to one over z this will give us a bounded um domain in the complex numbers because d emits a small disk around zero so we've reduced the bounded case so there's at least one such function f and as i said this is the point at which we need to use the fact that d is not equal to the whole of the complex numbers um, next, we're going to show that f prime of c0 is bounded. What, the, what this means is that no matter which injective f you take, there's a, there's a universal upper bound for them. And for, the, for this, we recall um, the Schwartz lemma. The most difficult part of the Schwartz lemma is trying to remember that Schwartz doesn't have a t in it because there's a some Schwarzes with a T and some without. It's kind of like Lorentz. There are lots of physicists called Lorentz, some with a T and some without a T. Anyway, um, the Schwarz lemma says that if you've got a map from the unit disk to the unit disk, then F prime of zero 
has absolute value less than or equal to 1, and it's less than 1 unless um, f is a rotation. And we're going to use this later. And this is quite easy to prove. All you do is you look at fc over z, and we can check this is bounded by 1 by by looking at its values on the circle very close to the unit circle. And um, since this is bounded by 1, this easily implies the derivative is at most 1 at 0. And um, if um, this is equal to 1 at some point, then f of z over z is constant, um, which implies that um, f must actually be a rotation. Anyway, um, what this means is um, we can now easily bound all these functions because we take our domain D and we're mapping it to the unit disk. Um, well, what we do is we um, we take our point Z0 and we take, just take some small disk around Z0 and our function f is bounded on this disk it maps this disk into this disk so by Schwartz's lemma we have a universal um, upper bound on all such on the derivatives of all such functions at z0 um, um, so um, what we can find is we can find a sequence of functions f1 f2 and so on with fi of z0 the, the derivative of fi at z0 tends to m, which is the maximum value of um, um, f of z0 prime. Not the maximum value, we haven't shown the maximum exists, so it's, say it should be called the supremum. Because we've shown that there is such a finite value m. And the problem is, do these fi's converge to some limit f? And this is, in general, this is a rather tricky problem. Um, so if you've got a sequence of functions, obviously you can't always, that, that necess doesn't necessarily converge, but you can ask if the functions are bounded, can we find a convergent subsequence? And this sounds quite plausible because if you've got a convergent sequence of real numbers, we can find a convergent subsequence if it's, if it's bounded. So, sorry, if we've got a bounded sequence of real numbers, we can find a convergent subsequence. And the answer is, in general, no. For instance, if we look at functions f from the unit interval to the unit interval, we can find a sequence that has no convergent subsequence. And the, the first one will sort of oscillate a little bit, and the second one will oscillate more, and the third one will oscillate even more, and so on. So we can have a sequence of bounded functions with no convergent subsequence. Um, and the problem here is that the derivatives get large. Or if f isn't differentiable, it's it's the differences between points get very large. And there's a basic theorem called the Arzela Ascoli theorem, which says that we can find a convergent subsequence if, um, well, the, the Arzalea theorem says we can find a convergent subsequence if the, if the sequence is equicontinuous. And the trouble with this is that no one can ever quite remember what equicontinuous means. But roughly what it means is that if we have a good bound for the derivatives of fi, and uh, what we mean by good bound, um, I'm not going to worry about too much. But the point is, if we can bound derivatives of these functions, then we can always find a convergent subsequence. And the point is that um, if we're working for, with real functions, there's no easy way to bound the derivatives. If we're working with complex holomorphic functions, then we've got a good bound. So the, 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 the dr derivative of a function at a is given by 1 over 2 pi i times the integral of f of z over z minus a squared dz. And 
what you notice here is that if we have a bound on f of z, um, then we get a bound on this integral. Here, here this is a, we're integrating a little circle around a. So we get a bound on the derivative. There's one slight catch. We need to be able to integrate around this little circle. So if we have a bound of f on some region, we get a bound on the derivative in a slightly smaller region. And this turns out to be good enough to show that we get a convergent subsequence. Um, well, you need to think about what convergence means, and, and it turns out to mean uniformly convergence on compact subsets, and I'm not going to worry too much about what that means. Um, the point is that if we've got a bounded sequence of holomorphic um, um, functions in, in the complex plane, then th th there's this very general theorem saying you can nearly always find a nice convergent subsequence for some, in some sense of the word convergent. Um, by the way, um, I can give an example of um, some an example of why you need to be a bit careful. What we're trying to do is we're trying to maximize um, the derivative of a function at some point given some boundary conditions, um, like, like it has to take z zero to zero. Um, if you try and maximize um, the integral from zero to one of f of z dz, given that f of z um, is bounded by 1 and f of 0 equals f of 1 equals 0, then there's actually no solution to this um, because we can find functions, we can find a function like that or we could have another function that looks like this and so on. So you can make the, 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 the supremum of this is one, but there's no function that actually takes the supremum. So you've got to be a bit careful about um, saying that if you've got a sequence of functions, then you can find some function maximizing some value because it doesn't always hold. Um, the, the point is the Arzela Ascoli theorem says we can actually find a function maximizing the derivative of, of f prime of zero. Um, um, but that's that, that's because we can we, we, we've got a good bound for the derivative of these functions. Notice, by the way, that the derivatives here are getting very large. So, so as usual, if if you can't bound the derivatives, then you have trouble showing that, that there's a convergent sum sequence. Um, so now we come to point four. We have found f um, from d to u maximizing f prime of z0 um, here, here uh, where, where f is injective and holomorphic and now what we want to do is is we need to show f is injective and surjective and showing it's injective is fairly easy, and showing it as surjective is kind of tricky. Um, so so for, for showing it's injective, it's not very hard to see this. So, so suppose the limit isn't injective. So suppose the um, um, suppose we've got d here, and um, under f it sort of maps to something that's not injective. So, so, so it, it might sort of overlap itself a bit there. And then since the image of this is open, you can see if, if you deform it slightly, it's still not injective. Um, but since f is a limit of some sequence f1, f2, f3, and so on, where all these fi's are injective, f must also be injective. Um, this depends on the fact that d is open, by the way. If d is closed, then the, the, the limit of injective maps from D to something need not be injective. Um, so um, we've got the, 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 the tricky part of the whole proof is proving that this limit is, is surjective. So how do we do that? Um, well, let's first of all, we, we, we need to show um, that if we've got some map F going from d to the unit disk taking um, f take, take, taking z0 to 0 we've got to show that if f 
is not on two, we can find a new um, uh, function g with g prime z0 strictly greater than f prime of z0. Um, and to do this, I, I first need to quickly review Mobius transformations. So we recall that we've got some Mobius transformations that go from the unit disk to the unit disk. And these take z to a um, um, z minus a over 1 minus a bar z. And here we can choose any a in, in the unit disk. And we can even multiply this by e to the i theta, where, where theta is some real number. Um, and these form a group of holomorphic maps from the unit disk to itself. And it acts transitively. Um, that means it can take any point in the unit disk to any other point in the unit disk by, by, by some, some group element. Um, furthermore, it's, uh, you can easily check that the only elements of this group fixing mapping the mapping z the, the only elements of the group of all maps from the unit disk to itself mapping zero to zero are rotations. That follows easily from Schwartz's lemma that I mentioned a bit earlier. So, so this is the full group of all maps from the unit disk to itself. Um, so now let's try and construct this function g. So let's think what we've got. So we've got this domain d, and we've got a map f of, from d to the unit disk. And it maps z0 to the point 0. And we're going to suppose that it emits some point d. So it emits some point that I'll write in blue. Actually, I think I'll write it in um, pink because blue doesn't seem to show up very well. Um, so um, if, if we think of d as being some sort of purple region, then we can its image in purple might be something like that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply Mobius transformation and move this point that it doesn't take, move this special point to zero. Um, let me put a blob in the middle so it looks the same. Um, and this purple region will, will end up looking something like that. And naught the, the image of the point zero will now be somewhere here. So this is a Mobius transformation. And now I'm going to apply the square root. And this will map the um, point zero to itself. And it will do something funny to the image of this purple region. and Map it to something else. And finally, I'm going to apply another Mobius transformation. In order to move this point back to zero. So um, things will now look like this. Um, here I have this the image of D will look something like this and there will again be another pink point there. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this map, my, my new map, to be the composition of all these maps. So this is my new map G. And what we want to, we need to show that g prime of z0 has absolute value greater than f prime of z0. Um, and, and this will finish the proof. Um, so how do we do that? Well, um, what we do is we look at this composition, let's call it h, um, which goes from this purple region to this purple region here. H isn't defined on the whole unit disk because we kind of took a square root at this point. And this, this will follow from if we can show that um, H prime of C0 is has absolute value less than 1 by the rule for composition of derivatives. So we've just got to prove this. And this in turn will follow from the fact that H, um, if we take the inverse of H, 
and take its derivative at sorry that should be a zero not a z zero at zero then this is absolute value less than one by the taking the inverse of a derivative and there are two ways to do this first of all we could write down an explicit formula for h it's not too difficult it's a mobius transformation followed by a square root followed by a mobius transformation and we could differentiate explicitly and after about a page of calculation we could show that it was at, it did actually have absolute value um greater than one so that should have been a greater than one um so uh um, however, there's an easy way to see it without any calculation, which is to observe that H is a holomorphic map from the unit disk to the unit disk. Now, Schwartz's lemma implies that its derivative at zero is less than one if H is the minus one is not a rotation. And it's not a rotation because we've stuck a square root sign in there. I mean, I mean, if, if we just had Mobius transformations, it might have been a rotation. Um, so this completes the proof of Riemann's mapping theorem. Notice, by the way, there's nothing particularly special about the square root sign here. Um, all we need is that the inverse of this maps the unit disk to itself in a nice way. So instead of taking square roots, we could also use nth roots. Um, provided n is greater than or equal to 2. Um, we can't take n equals 1 because then we would run into this problem that this map might actually be a rotation. Um, 